Generating traffic and sales can be a challenge for online merchants. But selling on the Walmart marketplace puts your products in front of millions of customers who shop on walmart.com. And right now, sellers who join Walmart Marketplace can save up to 50% on referral and fulfillment fees for the first 90 days. So get started today. Head over to marketplace.walmart.com slash savings. That's marketplace.walmart.com slash savings. Today's podcast is sponsored by SLI Systems, providers of intelligent site search and navigation solutions. Learn more at sli-systems.com and listen to their interviews at ecommercepodcast.com. Welcome to the e-commerce conversation with Pat Callahan, a weekly podcast focusing on e-commerce topics, featuring interviews with prominent people in the e-commerce space. And now let's move right on over to Pat to see who he has queued up for this week's interview. Welcome to e-commerce conversations. I'm Pat Callahan, and today I am joined by Justin Hertz president of Mutt Mart. You can find it online at muttmart.com. Hey, Justin. Hey, Pat. How's it going? Good. How are you doing today? Terrific. It's good to have you, and I appreciate your time. Absolutely. It's good to be here. Well, like I said, it's great to have you. Uh, what do you say we get this conversation started? Sounds talk, good. Let's talk about Mutt Mart. Okay. What do you guys do? Well, we sell pet products, uh, primarily focus on uh, everything for your dog for less, which is sort of our tagline. We got started in the business uh, primarily with rawhide dog bones, rawhide, pork hide, pressed hide, all the good chewies and things like that that keep your dog occupied and keep them from chewing your couch and shoes and whatnot. And then we've uh, expanded it to, you know, be, being a one-stop shop for your dog. Really, basically everything with the exception of dog food uh, is, uh, what we carry. So, you know, that's that's kind of how we got going. When did you guys start? We started in 2002, and we started on the wholesale side. Basically, we were importing rawhide dog bones in and private labeling them under our house brand, which we called Happy Bones. And we had we were selling them via wholesale uh, to the mom-pop pet stores throughout the United States. And we got up to uh, eventually about 750 independent accounts. And that, so that's how we got going in the business in general. And then we did that for approximately two years. And then the last three years, uh, we've been focusing on doing direct-to-consumer sales through our website, mumart.com, and other avenues like eBay, Amazon, etc. How has your success been with eBay and Amazon? It's been really good. eBay is really kind of how we got started in the direct-to-consumer angle. It was just kind of an accident. We were selling stuff wholesale uh, to all these independent pet stores. There's always changes. There's changes in your packaging. There's changes in your flavors that you offer, that kind of thing. You're always left with back stock. And so one of the things that I did probably three, four years ago was I threw a, I threw up a pack of rawhide dog bones, kind of using a Costco pricing philosophy where uh, I threw up like 40 dog bones for some price that was, you know, quite attractive and threw it up on eBay and just kind of used that as a, as a, a means by which to get rid of back stock and inventory that, that we couldn't sell via wholesale any, any longer. And it, it sold and it turned out to be a great avenue for us where, you know, we put up a, another listing and another listing and another listing. And before we knew it, you know, 15, 20, 25 percent of our total sales and total volume was, was going direct to consumer. So it kind of got me thinking, well, maybe I have something here. You know, maybe there's something beyond the wholesale market and something beyond even just just the eBay market, you know. So let's explore uh, creating our own website and and going from there. That's a great idea. One thing I wanted to ask you when I found out we were going to be speaking is, and I checked out your site, are you – did you consider yourself a business person first or uh, an animal person first? Because I'm, I'm a big animal lover. And good, good, good question. Both, but I, I wasn't. I, I was far more of a business person than I was an animal person. I mean, I've always had dogs since I was, I don't know, seven or eight years old, and loved dogs and loved animals in general. But you know, make make no mistake, this wasn't this wasn't a philanthropist, you know, c- conception of. <laughs> of of saving saving the world one dog at a time or whatever. This was this was a business and this was my means by which 
that uh, I could do my own business. I was working for the family business before I started this company, and I wanted to get away from that. I wanted to, you know, make my own mark and do my own thing. And so, yeah, this was this was definitely a business. We've had, you know, a good number of generations in our family that have been entrepreneurs. So I, I think I, I had a sense from an early age that, that I wanted to go into business and I wanted to do my own thing. So it just happened to be that by accident, and again, I, I, I really think that despite what most entrepreneurs will tell you in their sort of conceited, uh, you know, as they sit in their golden throne kind of way, that they'll tell you that it was all sort of part of this master plan, you know, that, that didn't happen with me. It was, it was an accident, and I think that that's the case with the majority of entrepreneurs is that it, it's all just sort of a series of accidents that lead you to wherever you are. So sorry, I, to, get, sorry to get so esoteric, esoteric with you or whatever, but, but I, I would say, you know, you know, here is the thing. I was working for the family business. We were importing leather products for the shoe repair and shoe manufacturer industries in the United States. My job was to go to tanneries throughout the world and source new goods for cut soles, things of that nature. I went to a handful of tanneries that in addition to making cut soles and upholstery leather and garment leather and all of those kinds of things, also made rawhide dog bones. And I thought, huh, this is interesting. You know, I like pets and it certainly seems to be a booming industry, a multi-billion dollar industry. Maybe I have something here. Send me some samples, uh, get me some prices, and, and I'll see what I can do with it. And uh, that's how it happened. Well, it's funny. That's a great story. The series of accidents is the part I like the best because it seems like a big believer and everything happens for a reason. And it's, like I said, that's a great story. Thank you. Yeah. What do you feel separates you from your competitors? And I have no idea how many other people are selling pet products online, but it's got to be a uh, lot. Yeah, I'm sure there's uh, I'm sure there's hundreds, if not thousands, of little little websites here and there that whether they carry everything for your dog like we do, and Petco, and PetSmart, and Dr. Foster Smith, and that's enough of plugging my competitors. <laughs> but uh, whether we do whether they do that or they have some specialty thing where they sell sweaters for poodles or whatever it is, there's, you know, again, probably thousands. Uh, as far as viable companies that I would, you know, I guess consider the competition and, and I don't really get overly consumed with that kind of thing anyway, but, uh, you know, probably probably a couple hundred. Yeah, I'm sure. And so, I mean, it's it's a competitive market, a very competitive market. I would say one of the things is that you got to be, you can't be so concerned with being caught up in price because being price competitive and being a penny less than the competition can only get you so far and that can only last so long because you never know who your competition is. You never know when it'll come a point where they garner up, you know, a $200,000 loan and they have more money in the bank than you do and they're able to therefore buy a bigger volume and get a lower price. And then suddenly you're one cent less and they're five cents less than you you can only play that game so long. So I think one of the things that we focus on is customer service and really trying to bring an old school brick and mortar. And I don't even mean, I don't even mean today's brick and mortar because I think it's difficult to find good customer service out there, you know, in, in the retail environment. Period. Today, you know, with the with a few exceptions of some great stories like Nordstrom's and Costco, the companies that really focus on that. But beyond that, I'm talking about going back you know, 20 years and thinking about, you know, what customer service was like then. And I think it was vastly, you know, considerably better than it is today. So we, we kind of try to take that, those kinds of things, and apply them to an online world. And I think what's really unique about that is, is that the online world, the nature of, you know, online sales and whatnot is that it's very, you know, it's, it's, it's almost devoid of personal contact. You know, big websites like Amazon and all sorts of other companies literally hide their contact information from you. Finding a toll-free number is, like, completely impossible to do. <laughs> you got uh, that right. Yeah, so, you know, one of the things that we do is we get away from that. You know, we have our toll-free number uh, prominently displayed, and we have multiple ways for people to contact us, whether it's via email or Skype or uh, AOL Instant Messenger, and we really focus on, you know, having an actual contact with our customers so that, you know, we can get to know them by name and get to know maybe a little bit about them, maybe what 
dog, what kind of dog they have, or maybe a little bit about the story of their dog, things of that nature. We have a Mutt of the Month and Top Mutt section on our website that's sort of a fun, interactive, again, another way for us to get to know our customers, another way for them to be able to sort of express themselves beyond just going onto our website, picking up some dog bones and leaving in sort of, you know, a cold and, you know, typical e-commerce environment. Yeah. Um, you know, instead, they can go on there, they can submit a picture of their dog, they can enter a contest to be mud of the month, cute, fun, interactive things like that, which I think, you know, give people sort of a warm and fuzzy feeling about our company and our website. And, you know, after all, you know, what is your relationship with your dog if it isn't warm and fuzzy? Of course it's warm and fuzzy. It's a very emotional thing. Sure, you buy them some bare necessities in terms of you buy them dog food and, and things of that nature or whatever, but the majority of the things that you buy your, your, for your pet is sort of an emotional purchase. You buy them the cute toy or, the, or you know, any of these kinds of products because you, know, you see it as, as being a, a way for you to kind of show your love for your pet. You know, so we embrace that, the very nature of that business and of that relationship that people have with their dog. And that's how we have, you know, the Mud of the Month contest and Top Mutts and, and things of that nature. I think that those are all interesting attributes to personalizing a website and good ideas. One thing I wanted to ask you, Justin, with your experience, for someone who is considering venturing online for the first time, right. creating an e-commerce site, what advice would you have for them? Well, I mean, I, I would say one thing is, Stick to the fundamentals, and, and that is, you know, one of the key things is don't overlook a business plan. I think a lot of people have this sense that, you know, well, it, it's an online business, and maybe they're running it out of their house and shipping out of their garage, and, uh, you know, they don't have the typical expenses that are involved with a brick and mortar, you know, rent, utilities, and, and et cetera. And so they overlook the importance of the fundamentals, you know, of sort of business 101. And having a solid business plan and really thinking things through and looking at finances and, and profit and loss and things of that nature. But, you know, at the same time, as much time and as much effort as you put forth into your business plan, which it should do, at the same time, I think you need to have flexibility. And you need to learn that there's going to be certain things that you figure out, quote, unquote, on the job, where six months in, you might just scrap your business plan. You know, there, there might be so many discrepancies in terms of what you originally thought versus what you've now learned that one of the biggest mistakes that you can make is being so stubborn or so pigheaded as to stick to your business plan just because, you know, you put in 10 hours into writing a business plan. So, you know, I would say that, that that's, that's a key. Have a plan, but then have the, the wherewithal and the, the flexibility to be able to change that plan as you go. Good advice. One last question before I wrap up this conversation. Sure. I'm always curious, Justin, what were some of the biggest mistakes you made when you first started out? Well, what I just talked about in terms of not having the, the kind of flexibility, I think I, I had to learn that the hard way in terms of putting, kind of putting all your eggs into one basket. My, my whole plan with eBay, once I got eBay going and once I started having twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 in sales per month uh, on eBay, then I started thinking, well, okay, look, the master plan is that we're going to build this website, montmark.com, and we're going to have, we're going to basically convert all of our eBay people over to our website because 10 to 15% of your sales are going to go to your eBay expenses and PayPal and all those kinds of things. So if I could just get all those people to follow me over to the website, then, you know, I could offer them lower prices and better, better features and, and all those kinds of things while at the same time making a higher profit margin because I don't have to pay those that 10 to 15% seller fees and that kind of thing. And so I put so much time and so much money and so much effort into building this incredible website with all of these features and all of these kinds of things. And the fact of the matter is, is that, yeah, there's a good percentage of people that are willing to make that transition, especially if given an incentive of a 10% off coupon code or something of that nature. They're willing to be converts and go from eBay to your website. But then there's a large percentage of them that just like shopping on eBay, that that's, that's their thing, and they like eBay, and they like uh, the, the comfort of the feedback rating and that kind of thing. So I had to learn the hard way, and I think that was one of my sort of pitfalls and things that I had to learn was that 
the eBay market is a very viable and sustaining market, and it's a, it's a great thing to work on. So is Amazon, that kind of thing. But I think you have to see those things sort of as separate entities. Sure, if they follow you over to your website, that's terrific. That's great. But if they don't, then you know, don't turn your back on them. Encourage them to continue shopping with you on eBay and to can continue shopping in your eBay store, et cetera, et cetera. We have a, a newsletter that goes out on a weekly basis, and there's some fun things in there, and there's always usually a coupon code and that kind of thing. And one of the big primary features in our newsletter is sort of down towards the bottom is a big graphic that says shop where you like. And it's got eBay on the one side, and it's got our website on the other side. And it's, again, re reinforcing to them that, hey, you can shop wherever you like. We just want you to stick with us and to continue shopping with us and to be happy. And uh, we don't care where you, where you buy. If, if, you, if you're comfortable buying in the eBay environment, buy, buy from us on eBay. That's fine. If you want to follow us over to the website and check out the things that we have to offer uh, on the website, that's great, too. I think, you know, again, don't put your eggs all in one basket. Don't, don't have such a forced plan and lack the flexibility to change that plan as things go along. Um, and, you know, uh, embrace your various markets that you have available to you, you know, and uh, keep those as, again, kind of separate entities and recognize that they're all sort of equally important and they all deserve sort of an equal amount of time. And I think those are important things that I learned and had to learn the hard way. Well, I appreciate you sharing that. And I appreciate you sharing all the, the tips and tricks and your stories too, Justin. Uh, it was great to have you on, and I hope to talk to you again soon. Definitely, Pat. I, I really enjoyed it. I look forward to it. All right. Thanks, Justin. Thanks, Pat. <laughs> That's all the time we have for this week's e-commerce conversation with Pat Callahan. I hope you enjoyed it. Tune in next week for another new episode to find out who Pat will be speaking with.